Okay. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I always carry a mic in my back pocket. <coughs> Used to be a comb when I was young and free and dangerously good looking, but it all changed. Something went wrong. Well, good day, ladies and gents. Such an honor and a pleasure to greet you all and talk to you all this morning. And welcome to everybody online behind that camera over there. So good to have you. And I hope that audience is growing. Um, Pastor Paul sent me an email asking me to conclude the series of Kings and Priests because uh, he's talking obviously at the Innisfail campus and so you never say no to the pastor. He gave me quite short notice but uh, you never say no to him. So I said, yeah, sure. But you know what, with Pastor Paul, he always seems to ask me to talk at the end of a series. And that's hard because the scripture's been done to death, the topic's been done to death and I've got to keep you awake for the next 40 minutes. So... <laughs> And then I've got to follow Pastor Joel, which is also quite intimidating, Joel Ramsey. Anyway, I'm not going to heal anyone today, so we'll just uh, work on it. But you know, guys, um, forgive me for reading a bit of my notes. I've done, I think, three speaking engagements already this week, and I've got one this afternoon in the States, and then three more, and one's at 3 a.m., so my brain, I need my little etchings to figure out where I'm at, okay? So I haven't heard all of the messages that were done on this topic for this last month because I've been away speaking a fair bit, um, but I heard one or two of them really, really good. Kerry did one, I think, last Sunday, other Sunday, it's very, very good. So if I repeat stuff that you've already heard, I'm sorry, but it's just uh, you're a captive audience, so it's too bad, you know? <laughs> okay, so Pastor Paul said the series is all about our identity, identity and our authority in Christ as a royal priesthood and how we should be able to stand in that authority as Christians and not be subject to the elements around us or the issues around us, okay? So, okay, so we're talking about real life here. That's the way I interpret this kings and priests thing, okay? Taking authority or dominion over those elements that Paul's talking about or the issues or the dilemmas that we all face in the real world. So we better know where we stand on the scale of kings and priests because there's a scale, okay? So I'm sure you've been told throughout this month that in the Bible says we are kings and priests, not kings or priests, no doubt. So that means we're a blend of both, and there's a real reason why we're a blend, and I'll come to that in a second. But if you can visualize the scale, let's just put the kings on the left and the, and the priests on the right. So we're all somewhere on that scale, and God very, very deliberately and intentionally designed each of your DNA and my DNA to be exactly where he wants us to be on that scale. Nothing random here. It's, it's not, and as we go into this a little, you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, so that means we should live and think and act and strategize, so repeat, strategize according to where we are on that scale. So we should be planning stuff on that scale, where, where we think we are. <clears throat> as we uh, live, think, act, and strategize, we should come up with solutions to those dilemmas and issues that are going on around us that we're either standing against or standing for. Okay, that's what Christians are supposed to do. That's what Jesus did. So let's just take the scale. Here's, here's Pastor Nick. Um, I would say he's more a priest than a king, but he's still a blend, okay, because he's a pastor. Um, so there's plenty of elements of a king there. Kings, incidentally, obviously, is gender neutral, okay, for the uh, crazy people who want to try and turn it around. Um, so that would mean that Pastor Johanna then is also uh, a more priestly than kingly, so she's on that side as well, but providing, you know, solutions for the youth and uh, serving in the church and so on. Pastor Paul is also a priest king, okay, so he's gone past the 50 and he's on that side as a priest king, but he has to use his kingly side a lot because he's kind of like a CEO running a business, running this church, okay? So we're drawing on all of these attributes as a blend. Conversely, I'm a king priest, so I'm over to the left if the scale was going in that direction. Um, because by way of, of the way I'm designed and what I have to do, so I run a large group of companies in the marketplace. I also run one of the biggest marketplace ministries in the world, but it's a marketplace ministry, so I'm operating in the marketplace, which means much more of the king side than the priestly side. My king side is very, very strong. And so on, but I am still a blend. Here I am on a Sunday talking in church, which is not my normal domain, right? Now, if, if we know where we stand, and if I know where I stand on that scale, I will act accordingly and strategize accordingly, and therefore be much more successful in my faith and in my life generally. And that's precisely why 
KI, Kingdom Investors, the ministry that I run, for those that don't know me, we ended up with 100 of our alumni, plus 20 pastors, plus me, plus Dave Leslie, in the White House in 2019 at the personal request of Mike Pence to come and discuss, the vice president, okay, to come and discuss domestic financial policy in the US, not, nothing else. Domestic, they, they wanted to know what are our thoughts, how are we going to grow jobs organically, what are we doing with these pastors, that kind of stuff. It's because I know where I stand on the King Priest scale and work on that spot accordingly, and that, that's my area. That's why I'm not running the, the creche at the back there, okay? <laughs> <coughs> and the same applies to anybody's, okay? So that kind of makes me a King Priest, and I'm, whenever I'm lecturing, I'm lecturing in that genre of ministry as opposed to preaching and, and looking for amens and all that kind of stuff, all right? So it's a slightly different. And I'm always, obviously, my bent is towards the marketplace. So in, in Matthew 24, Jesus states, the end will not come until the gospel of the kingdom has been taught throughout the world from testimony. So you guys know that pretty well. The gospel of the kingdom is predominantly the domains of the king. And as you scale towards the other side, the gospel of salvation is predominantly the, the domain of the evangelist and the priest, okay? Predominantly, we're still a blend. Now, the, if you, the, the gospel of the kingdom itself is, is predominantly king priest in the marketplace, as I've said, and obviously the gospel of salvation is outworked mainly in the, in the mountain of the church. So not always, but that is the general thing. We still have salvations at KI, even without doing altar calls. It happens a lot because there's pastors in the audience and God's saying, hey, that one, that one, that one, I'm not saved. Okay, so when you work with people that think that they are only a king or only a priest, that's the time to beware because that's not what the Bible says, okay? And that's where fanaticism comes from. That if people, if you can imagine a, someone that thinks that they're a king and have no priestly characteristics, very dangerous despot ruling, Hitler, etc. Okay, many of those throughout history. And that, be careful of that because... God didn't make people that way. If you've got to have a king, they better have some softer, even Jesus, even God himself. They all have those king and priestly aspects, all right? So again, we're a blend. Okay, back to Matthew 24. Jesus said the, the gospel of the kingdom is not going to come until, or the end is not going to come until the gospel of the kingdom is taught from testimony. So that means proof or evidence, and by extension, that means practical examples and stories and even right here, even in the modern world, even in the church, okay? So we've got to prove that the Word of God works in the marketplace um, in, in today's world. So uh, uh, Pastor Nick was saying, you know, God of miracles today, even now, still in the modern world, and that's it. So let's come back now to the probably the key scripture you guys have been listening to, which is 1 Peter 2.9. Um, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the, the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, don't know what you were, you weren't a people, okay, um, meaning you weren't uh, saved as such or converted in those days, so once were not a people but are now a people of God and had not obtained mercy but now you have obtained mercy. Okay, let's put this into the context of what is going on politically and socially at the time in the Holy Land in the first century, okay? What is going on in Peter's head when he's writing that or when he was compiling that? And if we can figure that out, then we can extrapolate it out into the modern marketplace or into the church today in the modern world. So the Jews, as you guys know, we've spoken about first century Palestine a lot. Um, Jews are living in utter despair. Um, they've been plundered of their wealth, they've been, they're starving, they're medically sick because they can't afford healing anymore. The church, is, the, the temple has ramped up the prices. They're totally oppressed, they're selling their kids. Everything's going wrong, all right? And they're enduring the massive oppression from the Romans as well. Starving, sick, they're just about at breaking point. Jesus has come, and all of this is due to the corruption and greed and self-centeredness of the priests and the ruling elite, basically, and the Romans, of course. So by this time, Jesus has come, He's lived on earth, he's been crucified, he's been resurrected, um, and his resurrection, straight after the resurrection, obviously Jesus has appeared to more than 500 people, testimony, proving the point, here I am, check me out, come and see. And of course, Peter was very much one of those people who Jesus appeared to and had dialogue with. So by the time Peter compiles this book, the vast majority of the original God's people, so the Jews, I'm specifically saying the original God's people, 
the Jews had rejected Jesus by that time. So you guys know all this. It's just background to what's to come. So Peter, because of the rejection, because the Jews rejected Jesus, Pete is now talking to the Gentiles, and he's having dialogue with the Gentiles, right? What happened? I just hit a wrong button there somewhere. Okay. So this is the, the dialogue and the gist of the conversation. You Gentiles must not become like the Jewish leaders. This is what Peter is insinuating. Um, and not like the Jewish leaders and the priests who are corrupt, greedy, and self-centered. They are animals plundering their own people. You must be the opposite. You must be a nation of kings and priests who provide solutions, okay? And as you, as you do this, and this is the important part, this is the whole of what's going on behind this scripture and other scriptures in the Bible at the time. Remember, Peter was a contemporary of Paul and various others, and they're all living under the same circumstances, same stuff's going through their head. They didn't always agree with each other, of course, but nevertheless, they've still got the same dynamics going. So as you do this, God's people will see this. So the Jews will see what you Gentiles are doing, and they will be grafted back onto the vine. Okay, so that's the strategy that's going on here. They rejected Jesus. God wants them back. You Gentiles, you and me, that's our, one of our primary functions in our faith. Okay, so here's 1 Peter 2.12. We're just carrying on a little bit, same scriptures. People who don't believe are living all around you, meaning the Jews. They may say that you're doing wrong, so live such good lives that they will see the good that you do, meaning solutions, okay? The good that you do under the current circumstances where they're all living the, means the, the, the solutions to the poverty, the starvation, the persecution, the corruption, the trafficking, and so on. That's what's in Peter's mind when he's writing these scriptures. And then he carries on, and they, the Jews then will give glory to God on the day that he comes. In other words, they'll be grafted back under the vine. So in other words, guys, we've got to do this. If we do this well and we do this properly, then the scriptures will be fulfilled and the Jews will be come back onto the vine of God. All right, so that's what's going on in the background. Now, that means that we would be providing solutions according to where we are positioned on that scale, king-priest scale, all right, so that we can maximize the gifting and, and what God's put into us, the training and everything else. So... That king priest guy. So if we did that, the Jews will be actually become jealous. If they see that you guys are all getting blessed, they actually become jealous. And it says that in the Bible. And that's one of the main reasons why the Jews will come back. So all of Romans, now we're moving from the book of Peter over to the book of Romans. Remember they're contemporaries. So this is Paul now writing. All of Romans 9, 10, and 11 is about exactly the same concept. Okay? Romans 10, 19. Um, Again, I asked, did the people of Israel not understand, meaning the Jews? Yes, they did understand. First, Moses says this of God, I will use those who are not really a nation to make you jealous. I will use a nation that does not understand to make you angry. And then right over the chapter into Romans 11, uh, this is verse 11. So I asked, when the Jews fell, did that fall destroy them? No, but their mistake brought salvation to those who are not Jews. The purpose of this was to make the Jews jealous. Okay, so this is all confirming what I'm teaching today. Um, their mistake brought rich blessings to the world, and what they lost brought rich uh, blessings to the non-Jewish people. So to the Gentiles, those who followed God's will and did good things, in other words, not, not being pious in church and so on, that's generic Christianity. I'm talking about doing your assignment in the marketplace that God wants you to do and doing it righteously. Don't plunder anyone in the process, okay? Um, and what they lost uh, brought rich blessings to the non-Jewish people. So surely the world will get much richer blessings when enough Jews become the kind of people that God wants them to. And that's because whenever you see the Jews become Messianic Jews or Christians, if you like, you just see the blessing. It's enormous, and they become very, very productive. They, they, they lead the world in just about every innovation you can think of. Okay, so Romans 9, 10, 11 are all about the Gentiles doing it properly, which in turn creates great blessings for the Gentiles, that's us, and then that uh, attracts the jealousy of the Jews, and they want to become Christians, okay? They want to believe. Okay, and here we are, Romans 11, 25. I want you to understand this secret truth, brothers. This is Paul, of course. Brothers and sisters, he says. Uh, this truth will help you understand that uh, what you don't know, or that you don't know everything. This truth... The truth is this, part of Israel has been made stubborn, but that will change when enough non-Jewish people start to believe in God. Okay, now the, the enough people start believing in God. By extension, that also means the unsaved Gentiles, guys. 
Okay, and that's why I said original uh, God's people earlier. Both Peter and Paul are now talking or treating the Gentiles as God's people, overtly so. After a lot of conflict and argument about it, they are now teaching Gentiles, uh, uh, treating Gentiles as God's people. And therefore, unsaved Gentiles will also come if we, the believers, do it God's way and work out where we are on that scale and so on, okay? Now, then we go on to Romans 12. So what Peter was talking about and all of Romans 9, 10, and 11 are saying the Jews rejected God, so you guys do it properly. Now in Romans 12, he tells us how to do it properly, okay? So once I'm finished telling you what this says, then I'll show you the testimonies of what it looks like in the modern marketplace. You've got to talk from testimony, especially if it's the gospel of the kingdom. <clears throat> okay, so here we go, Romans 12, 1. Um, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, and, and it's actually, I can't remember what this is called, um, this, this uh, passage. But anyway, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So your reasonable service is your assignment, okay? And doing it righteously. Um, so, um, yep, yeah, okay. Romans 12, 2. Uh, and be not conformed to this world. You guys know the scripture. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect of God's will. Transforming your mind. Keep in mind who's writing this. This is Paul. This is very soon before the whole of the... Jerusalem and the temple is about to get wiped out by the Romans, okay? They're, they're very worried about what's coming. And so th what he's saying is renew your mind. Think differently to all of these Jews, okay? Change this plundering and greed and self-centeredness. That's the renewing of your mind. There's a whole lot more in that. Don't have time for that now. But the point being, that's what's going on. That's what he's saying, okay? So now you've re uh, I'm assuming you've renewed your minds. You've changed your ways of operating because you are now king priests or priest kings or somewhere on that scale. And there's no room for all that rubbish if you're going to be one of those. So Romans 12.3, God has given me a specific gift, and that is why I, so this is Paul, I've got a gift, and this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. I know where I am on this scale. And that's why I've got something to say to each one of you. He's a teacher. Don't think that you are better than you really are. You must see yourself uh, just as you are. So he's trying to say, don't work outside of your boundaries. Don't think you're some kind of a legend. Okay, just work with what you've been given. That's where I want you to be. Get yourself onto that scale. Decide what you are by the faith God has given each of us. That's what he's saying. So in other words, work out where you're on that scale. Each of us has one body, and that body has many parts. These parts don't all do the same thing. So this is often associated with the church and ministries and stuff. Um, in the same way, we are many people, but in Christ we are all one body. We're all the parts of that body, and each belongs to another. So in other words, work with everybody on the scale. We have different gifts. Each gift became, each gift came because of the grace God gave us, etc. So I'm going to jump ahead of this, and, and you'll see how important it is to establish where you are when you understand all of that gifting and so on. Okay, then this is the bit here. This next passage of Scripture is called Marks of a True Christian. That's what they entitle it as. But don't think of it as a generic thing. Think of it as what the solutions are that you would provide according to where you are on that scale, okay? Your love must be real. Hate what is evil. Do, do only what is good. So Paul is referring to the corruption and the greed. When he says evil, what's in his mind? Everyone's starving, no one's getting healed, and so on, okay? He's, he's worried about all this stuff. That's what's bothering him. Love each other in a way that makes you feel close like brothers and sisters and give each other more honor than you give yourself because everyone's plundering everyone, all right? So drop all of that stuff. Treat each other as equal. You're all human. As you serve the Lord, work hard and don't be lazy. Be excited about serving Him. So don't be on the dole, guys. Get a job and, you know, hook in. Be happy because of the hope you have. Be patient when you have troubles. Pray all the time. Share with God's people who need help, all right? Look for people who need help and welcome them into your homes. There were so many homeless people in first century Palestine, starving. And it's a blooming desert, okay? It's not like you can go into the rainforest and eat a goanna. It's a pretty horrible place. <laughs> this is all about fixing the social distress and so on, which is still here. Wish only good for those who treat you badly. Ask God to bless them, not curse them. When others are happy, you should be happy with them. When others are sad, you should be sad with them too. That's this whole concept of empathizing with people so that you can find out the issues and fix the issues, okay? God brings them to you. Live together in peace with each other. I'm not sure that works. Okay. Um, don't be proud, but be willing to be friends. 
uh, th this business of don't be proud, this is this whole class consciousness that plagued the place and plagues a lot of com countries these days, racism, tribalism, it's all that sort of stuff. This, this, this is the problem of, with pride, okay? And that is why when God is going to heal our land, the very first thing he says is humble yourselves, okay? Get rid of this rubbish, this pride. And only then, humble yourselves, and only then are you going to be able to pray. Because praise is, your prayer is not going to be listened to if you're not going to humble yourself. All right? all right, if everyone does you wrong, don't try to pay them back by hurting them. Try to do what everyone else thinks is right. Do the best you can to live in peace with everyone. My friends, don't try to punish anyone who does wrong. Wait for God to punish them which, with his anger. It is written, I am the one who punishes. I will pay the people back. Why is that? The genuine reason for that is because if we start to take revenge, we perpetuate the problem. If you look now, you know, the French are ticked off with the, with the Aussies because we didn't buy their stupid submarines, okay? And, and they're 10 years overdue. So now they're sulking. So now if we start to perpetuate that and take revenge, just like China has, you know, by taking uh, commercial sanctions against us, it perpetuates the problem. Big, big chance of leading to war. That's why God doesn't want that. He'll take revenge. Our job's to provide solutions. Okay, so get the Frenchies back, sit down, boys, stop crying here, we can fix you, do do. Okay, but you should do this. Uh, if you have enemies who are hungry, give them something to eat. If you have enemies who are thirsty, give them something to drink. Doesn't it sound like the sheep nation narrative? It's all through the Bible. In doing this, you will make them feel ashamed. Don't let evil defeat you, but defeat evil by doing good. Okay, so you can see how Paul tells us how we provide the solutions based on where we are, based on our gifting and, and where we are on that scale. That's what I'm talking on about, okay? So who was the ultimate king priest? Jesus, right? King of the Jews. So he's slap bang in the middle. Uh, he's, he's everything a priest should be. He's everything a king should be. What did he do? What did he do physically on the ground, okay? What was his strategies physically on the ground? Even for his enemies, he provided solutions for the greatest dilemmas we have, even for death. And you know what? When he provided everlasting life through the crucifixion, and the resurrection, he did that even for his enemies, okay? So the point being, he's provided solutions. The people being plundered by the tax collectors, solution, convert the tax collectors. And so he converted Levi into Matthew and Zacchaeus and so on. People are starving, solution, feed thousands of them, okay? And he did it often. People could not get forgiveness because they were paying too much at the corrupt temple. Solution, chase the corruption out the temple. He went and trashed the money changers and whipped the, the selling, people selling the doves and so on. People are very sick because they couldn't afford the healing. Solution, heal them for free. Okay, medical aid, sort them out. And remember, guys, Jesus was a man. Okay, all of these miracles, 37 of them, I think, from memory, is because Jesus operated in his authority as a priest, king, king, priest. That's where it came from. Okay, and we're supposed to do that. So if we bring that into the modern world today, what are you and I, Gentiles, who operate on the scale of the, the king, priest, what are we going to do about this? what's going on around us and, and how we're going to fix it. Are we going to get involved in all the little conspiracy theories about 5G and vaccinations and all these troublesome things, or are we going to get on with the assignments that God wants us to do? Okay? Get involved in the conspiracy. Don't let them take over. You know, just hit delete every now and again. My assignment, Sheep Nations, um, many of you guys know, is the Lord showed me I needed to use my influence and my affluence to run a big company, a big ministry, to create the world's modern-day sheep nations, okay? So that's sheep and goat nations, Matthew 25, and use that as a benchmark to, for the rest of the world to look in and follow. So that means I'm going to need influence with governments uh, at a high level. I need to influence public policy. I need to influence election outcomes. I need to work also with the ground up, with small to medium enterprise, get momentum going for change and culture in the marketplace. So much that I need to do, so I better know where I'm standing. If I'm standing as a priest, ain't going to happen, okay? The government's not going to listen to me. I need to stand as a king when I'm talking to the government. I need to stand as a priest when I'm lecturing in marketplace ministry to some extent, okay? The Lord told me that in 2011, and we had two years to study it and launch in 2013. But by 2014, this is the proof that I'm talking about, proof of concept, okay? Matthew 24 stuff. By 2014, there was a lot of momentum in KI around the world, but the corruption's getting worse. And, 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 you know, we're coming under more and more attack, and I'm a king decreeing this and decreeing that and using foul language against the devil, you know, waking him up early when I get up and shouting at him. And you know what? Nothing's happening, okay? We're just getting momentum, but I'm not fixing the problems. So I went back to the Lord 
And I, I remember telling this story in the church some years ago, but in a different context. But it was in 2014. And I went back to the Lord really early one morning. I get up at four and go and pray. This was summer, so it was just, I think it was February. When you guys got married, Mia, that, that week, I think it was February, right? March? Okay, somewhere on there, yeah. You'd know better than me, I hope. <laughs> so um, that uh, morning, I was up really whinging and praying to the Lord. And it was early. It was just before first light. It was drizzling. I was out in the paddocks, and I was whinging. And I said, you know, how frustrated I was with the, the progress. And as a king, I'm decreeing stuff, and it's not happening. So, like, am I really a king? You know, Lord, am I a king? And I wasn't hearing anything. It was raining, and the Lord's probably still in bed at that time of day. But eventually I said, Lord, are you there? You know, I'm getting a bit petulant. And um, anyway, I came to the a fence on a farm, and I was just leaning on a fence post, praying and whinging and bleating. And as it started to get light, this peregrine falcon came, and it was just howling along at just above ground level, and it smashed. I was watching a, a, a cattle egret walking in front of me, or a little egret walking in front of me. Now, my language is the language of the bush, okay? God talks to you in your language wherever you're at. Pastors, he talks differently. To me, I grew up in the bush in Africa, didn't even speak English till I went to school. I learned the bush backwards, and then as soon as I came to Australia, I learned the Aussie bush, lectured on it, taught the Australian SAS how to track, literally, taught them in tracking teams and so on. And, and so I love the bush. So if I'm there leaning on a fence post watching an egret, I know all about the egret. Next thing, a falcon comes and just smashes it and kills it and starts to just breaks its back. And I looked at this, it's a little male, it's a baby, young falcon, and the mother comes, the, the, the females are bigger than the males, sits next to it, at first light, on the ground, two falcons, very rare, you don't find them sitting on the ground, twittering along, the mother flies off, and the other one flies off and leaves the egret behind. And I looked at this and thought, wow, this is the king of the skies, this is the fastest moving living animal. Nothing can fly as fast or run as fast as a peregrine falcon. And yet, it's, so it's the king of the skies. There was a prince being coronated to come a king right in front of me, and I'm saying, Lord, am I a king or not? Okay, and there's the Lord saying, yeah, you are from now on. You have now, this is what he's saying to me in my kind of language. And then I remember I asked, Lord, are you there? Well, it's raining, and I looked over, and there's a rainbow. And that rainbow is obviously the uh, signal of the Lord. Uh, and the fact is that rainbow stayed there for more than a week. Okay, because I remember when we went to the wedding, there was a, there was a rainbow there, and I was sitting with Merlin when we were going to have lunch, and I was telling her about this, and that rainbow was still there when we were up in Montville or somewhere, and it was for a whole week the rainbow stayed there. I said, Lord, are you there? He was very emphatic. Jesus said, I'll be with you till the end of the age. He's there. You should ask him and see if you get a rainbow. Okay, but the, here's the real big deal, you know. That same day, okay, uh, I had a... Um, couple of people coming from Western Australia, a, a, fam, a, a husband and wife, really sophisticated people. They owned a bunch of um, Hungry Jacks, I think, um, franchises and other franchises or um, Subways, I think they were. So quite affluent people. And they came over to talk to me about some business or other. Anyway, we're sitting in my boardroom and the wife is very quiet. And I know them from KI in Perth. And eventually they, they're mumbling to each other. And I said, what's going on? And she's, uh, so the husband says, oh, Susie had a, she's a prophetic lady, and she had a vision on the plane, on the Virgin uh, Airlines, and she wrote it on the napkin, but she's too scared to tell you. I said, Susie, go for your life. Yeah, I'm just an ordinary creature. Fire away. So she, now remember, I said, Lord, am I a king? And if I decree stuff, how come it's not happening? And are you there, Lord? That was in the morning, just before first light. Okay, so here's what she read off the back, and I've still got the actual the, the napkin, the Virgin napkin she gave me. Okay. And, and keep in mind my assignment is to fix, to create a sheep nation. Dave, you were at a banqueting table laden with gourmet food. That sounds like me. It was a wholesome royal banquet, seated at right hand of Christ. Well, that sounds good too. He asked you to select one meal on the table and then multiplies it by five. Then after walking together through the garden area, he sits at a table and spreads out a plan, okay, a map. He asks you to select a region, an area, and you do more than likely Australia. He, he, he erases the existing plan uh, that is there and asks you to redraw your plan. Remember, I had two years to study what does a modern day sheep nation look like? Okay, so he smiles, wipes his hand over it, uh, and, and a light shines over it. He endorses it, enhances it, and then a blinding light comes over the government officials and those in authority and in high places. Uh, they kneel before Jesus, and they are blindfolded, and documentation, documentation is passed between them, which they seal with a government seal and sign it, and it is dated 
2016. Okay, you're both smiling. So in other words, this is now being endorsed by the government, the Sheep Nation, right? Uh, uh, you both smile and walk, uh, uh, walk discussing the plans into a hall in some sort of distinguished room. He goes to the front of you and you wait in awe and wonderment and you're blown away. Um, you're then ushered into the front of the room and an angel presented before Christ comes in. He smiles, places a red robe around you. Am I a king, Lord? Okay. Places a red robe around you, a king's crown on your head and gives you a scepter, okay, which is what you decree with and so on. Remember that morning? Am I a king, Lord? How come no one's listening to me? All right, so that's the authority. Your wife enters from the side room and is given a green robe. Merlin must be a greenie or something. I don't quite know that. <laughs> you both kneel before the Heavenly Father and he anoints you with the oil and he sends you off and so on. So this is the thing, guys. You know, here we are today. Uh, I understand that, where I should be working, what I've got to do, what is my, you know, service uh, to the Lord. And it's the sheep nation concept. We better provide solutions. We're going to create sheep nations. We've got this massive plan to eradicate unemployment on the Sunshine Coast in one day. And that is being followed by the federal government with, with continuous dialogue. We're providing solutions for them that have never been provided anywhere in the world. And we've worked it out full strategy going ahead with it. So, you know, yes, you are a king. And yes, you've got a scepter. You should be decreeing stuff. But that plan that you put on that map, you've got to go and carry that out. These are the solutions. We've got to live, think, act, and strategize wherever we are sitting on that thing. Okay, so these days we're lecturing to governments all over the world. You know, places like Lebanon, it's the hardest government in the world to lecture to. They hate each other. The, the different Muslim groups hate each other. The two Christian groups hate each other. And then they all hate all of the others as well. So it's hard working with them. But we do. And then all over Europe, obviously Australia and so on. So there's so much going on, guys. You guys in this church, for example, Red Frog, that's a solution. Those are certain people working in that, that ministry. Brilliant, brilliant ministry. Remember when Luke and Nikki left here? Um, they were assistant pastors in charge of youth and then young adults, I think. You know what? Okay, so they mostly priest kings. They both got degrees, so there's just, to some extent, uh, there's quite a strong kingly ministry there. But you might remember when they left, they got up here and, and said cheerio, like a testimony night sort of thing. No less than seven young people got up here, you might remember that, who would have committed suicide had not they... Had they uh, not met that, met those two, or one, or one of those two, and, and during their, you know, their tenure as youth and young adults, seven, imagine, and when we had Dindins afterwards, more came, and I just thought, what's going on in this flaming city, man, Why is this, this is a good place to live, why is everyone committing sewage pipes, but at the end of the day, that's the point, they are providing solutions for these youngsters, imagine the fallout and the trauma and the distress when a young person, these are young adults, eh, commits suicide, in the family and the people who live in the community and everything else. And the solution is they, they worked wherever the scale is. They would have had to sit there and counsel those people. They would have had to be patient using all their skill sets and gifting and so on, okay? And then provide the solution. So that's what it means to be kings and priests, ladies and gents. And I hope that uh, puts it into some different perspective for you all. So God bless and thank you for staying awake. Awesome. So good, church. Can we just thank Dave again? That was such a good word. Love it. And as the musicians and singers come right now. Hey, in this moment right now, with everyone online as well, I want to ask in this moment, if we could all just close our eyes and bow our heads. And, and I'll, I'll, I want to do this out of respect and honor for any person uh, that wants to make this decision I'm going to ask about here today. And uh, you might not know about your authority or, or, or about this a thing that we've been talking about today about being a king or a priest and that's because you haven't yet first uh, entered into this amazing kingdom known as the kingdom of God with Jesus as king of your life and and today is an opportunity for you to make that decision to say you know what uh, maybe I've been living in my own kingdom and doing my own thing and I've been king of my own life and I've, wherever I say I go but right now is an opportunity to make Jesus Lord and king of your life to say, you know what, wherever you say uh, and wherever you say, I will go. And I'm telling you, there's so many people in this place here today that have said yes to Jesus as their Lord. And it has been a life-changing and transformational thing happened in their life that they can now live unto God and it is the best decision you'll ever make within your life. And I wanna give that opportunity. If you don't know Jesus here today, 
you don't know God for yourself, but you wanna know Him personally, intimately and uniquely today, He wants to come into your life and make a change in your life. So with every eye closed, if that's you and you wanna say, Nick, that's me, I, I need to know Jesus today. I want Him as Lord, as my, Lord of my life. Would you just raise your hand right now in this place? Come on, it's you, friend. He loves you. He doesn't want you to go another moment without knowing Him personally. He loves you as a plan, as a great plan that we've been talking about today. Come on, as I look across the room, just one more time, and everyone online as well, just raise your hand if that's you today. You need Jesus in your life. Thank you, George. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're gonna pray this prayer together anyone want to make this decision today and I'd love for you to repeat these words after me today let's pray this together dear Jesus today I invite you into my life today I'm a new creation in you I believe you died for me and you rose again to bring me new life and I thank you for that in Jesus name Amen. Amen. Awesome. Can we just celebrate with anyone here or online that made that decision for the first time? So, so good. And uh, we want to encourage you, if you did make that or you want to know more, uh, our QR code, once again, on the uh, seat in front of you or on the screen uh, is the greatest way in which you can connect with us as a church. And for anyone online, there is a link that you can say that I have decided with that decision, which is so, so good. But uh, church... We have been blessed here today. We're going to go out praising God together. And I believe we've got uh, crispy fish burgers uh, of some sort in the cafe, which is going to be awesome. Why don't you stick around after, grab one of those. Uh, they're better than a fillet of fish from Macca's. They're all going to be great. So uh, why don't you grab one? Uh, we're going to go out praising God. Let's do it together.